Yeah. Just has a giant stamp. An Asian stamp? Yeah, just and like... And wax. It's a dragon. Yeah. Black dragon. It's a black it dragon. Or a brown dragon. A yellow dragon. Yellow dragon. All right, ready? Actually, that'd be a great... Your clothing line should be yellow dragon. <laughs> <laughs> it would crush. Yellow dragon. It would crush. Right? Ready? Come on. Come on. Let's go. We're... I didn't mean to be gender assumptive <laughs> by calling you both gentlemen. I don't know how you guys roll. Podcast okay. studio, we'll build it out. We'll do wood on the back. And this is where we do content for the app, content for uh, podcasts. We'll be podcasting. This is going to be the Black Rifle Coffee first form kind of little area. We're going to mm -hmm. do a, a smoothie bar. We're going to, have to actually build out a bar. Uh, we're going to do coffee on, on a, on a uh, serve at your own. Right. Thing. Yeah. Is that called? Yeah. Self serve? Mm -hmm. Yep. Traditionally, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> this is our classroom. So students can observe other students in the simulations kind of scenarios. Oh, cool. This is a classroom. Again, this is out like bigger scale classroom. Fitness and then physical therapy. 2,500 square foot of uh, Jiu Jitsu mats. On the wall. You Remember? need six by six. You and one other person. He can't. He's already hurt himself. He's done training. Really? Can you climb that rope? Can you climb that rope? Probably. You weigh a you weigh a hundred pounds. I could probably climb that rope. No feet. Oh, I, I gotta climb. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got four. He's not sleeping. You know what I mean? Ooh, that this is um. Wow, that's a slick rope, Senor Andy. <laughs> <laughs> How many fucking books do I sell of your shit every fucking day in the coffee shop? I was telling him we had a guy come in and bought eighteen hundred dollars worth of field craft shit like two weeks ago. Yeah, I don't we, promote you. We at could all. be doing that in all black rifle coffees. Just saying. Well, field craft has to promote. Yeah. You know, you know, we've done. You know, we've done a pillars of preparedness seminar in Arizona, black rifle coffee, and it's sold out six times in a row. Yeah, I mean Arizona is like full of black rifle. Don't you on your fingernails? Like, you're, you're like that? No, Phoenix? you know why? You know what happens? You know what happens? What? You, so you, you'll get um, these little tiny fucking worms. You get worms that way. That's the way you get worms. Dude. Shut up. That's I, not even true. No, it is true. That's I'm disgusting. That by the I, it is right true. You just made that up. You made I didn't. It up. I'm looking. That no, up, dude. there are these. Uh, and I forget exactly. Like, it's one of those things that when you when you have kids because they're constantly chewing in their fingernails and they're eating shit and, from their nails and they're you know and you have like Poop. chickens and all kinds of fucking weird ass shit that's weird cruising shit. around goats, bro, that's where all that nasty little those little heebies live in there. Don't you like this setup? It's a little bit more intimate. Uh, it's, it's like we're in bed. Uh, I know it is. It, it's it we could very, be cuddled on this is on a dope, bed. dude. Yeah, am I right or you what? You can get worms from chewing on your nails, but. They're usually thread worms, and it's an unbearable itch from around your anus. It's a you scratch. Oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's it. Fuck just yeah. just giving you a heads up on on you know when, when, when we're talking about kids chewing their fingernails okay. and when they got a little again. itchy butthole, you're. How do you cut happens. your nails then? I use nail clippers like a fucking human. Like a man, like a fucking human, not like a like a man, some type of goat, or I don't know what you use on their fucking nails. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with you. Oh, I do I, like your. Uh, I do like your shirt. Do you ever wear any other shirt other than that one? <laughs> I'm. I'm just being. Fu I mean, you, when, when listen, you said, I love you promoting the company like anybody else, yeah. man. But fucking change your shirt, bro. Yeah, I'm just. If saying. I got more designs from you for shirts, actually, you're the only guy not wearing anything black. Right there. <laughs> no, this is my. This is my roaster. These are actually badass. That isn't even in the market. It's a, it, this roaster, no, this is the one off. I mean, which, what, how does that? Uh, Field Ethos. Look at this so, one, though. No. You don't have that one yet. That's pretty sick. This is a banger. Is that yeah. a new one? Yes. This is the new new. Yeah, this is a roaster shirt. So I, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I sent it out to you guys. We Are we recording the, this? Yeah. We won the Golden Bean. You sent that to me. Yeah. You didn't send it to me, but what the does that mean? The Golden Bean Award in the elite coffee category, which means it's the hardest award to get as a roaster. It's the seriously. Yes, it is. For what coffee? It's a gold medal. We we did Circus it for Bear. Circus Bear. Circus Bear is LTO that I come out with every year. And do you know what LTO means? Limited time offer. He limited didn't know. time offer. He didn't know. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I'm not a licensee. <laughs> yeah. So neither we, am I. <laughs> Circus Bear, dude, Edwin and I worked on that over the last few years. So we have we have two 
I, what I would say is forty fifty dollar bags of coffee. The LTOs that we, we release is a geisha one of those. Yeah, dictator geisha and circus bear. Uh, Ed was like, let's submit these this year, and we took it. We took gold in the elite category, which really? is the hardest category <laughs> to win. So. Every one of these fucking douchebag losers that keep saying like, oh, Black Rifle, they don't know how to roast coffee. It's like, yeah, we just took the hardest fucking metal there is to win in coffee. Is that a blind? Mm -hmm. I assume it's, it's blind. blind because they well, found there, out. There's no way. There, there's black no rifle, they way break. we would have won if yeah. it wasn't blind. There's no way. And I go, I was talking to Ed a few weeks before. The, I feel like the, the tasters can see. Huh? I feel like the tasters can see. The company? No, they're 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 definitely blind. You have to be blind. Okay. Yeah. Because they're yeah, I no. imagine they're not the most conservative kind of people. <laughs> no. When, 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 when you watch that video. I was making a blind yeah, joke, you fuck. Making a blind joke. <laughs> <laughs> right at uh, the top. Jeez. Oh, like, I don't have any fucking coffee. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dee Dee. Thanks, Dee Dee. You're so sweet. Right. You want one? So apparently not. Yeah, it's it's the it's the That's hardest. It's it's quite literally one of the hardest metals to receive. What's special about that coffee? What makes what makes it like well, I, for somebody like me who I love coffee? Yeah, yeah. But I don't understand what what's the difference between so, that and something else. Is it the the timing of roast? Well, well yeah, it's not the it, well, it's time. So I mean, like I, I've been roasting coffee since two thousand five six ish. So technically. When I look at this, I've got 17 years of roasting coffee. Yeah. And it's 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 funny for me because when I first started this, it was around how do I deliver fresh roasted coffee to subscribers within two weeks of it coming out of the, the, the roaster. And I wanted something that was like for guys like us because every one of these other companies out there, like San Francisco, Seattle, they have a very specific culture, right? We could say that they're – you know, woke or progressive or however you want to define them. It's like, you know, wonky ass blue hairs with fucking piercings all over their face. It's like a lifetime achievement medal for them to be in a, uh, you know, service industry for the rest of their fucking lives. But uh, when I look at this, it was like, I wanted guys like us to be able to walk in there and be like, oh, this is fucking cool. This is a cool place. You know, like got American flags and you got like, you know, leather chairs. And the first question isn't like, what are your pronouns? It's like, oh, here's a great cup of coffee. So for me, Circus Bear has been one of those things that I've worked on for several years to get not only the profile right, but also the design right. Circus Bear comes from a guy that we worked with. You his remember? call sign, yeah. His call sign is Circus Bear, yeah. and he was a fucking Circus Bear. So he's a former team guy that liked to get drunk every now and again, and he might or might not knock you the fuck out. That's you don't know. Sense. That checks out. Like, yeah, yeah. It's so, <laughs> depending on the night. <laughs> you might or might not like, you get, get fucked up. Who knows? Like, you just know, like, when you're around him, and he might be sober and decide to fucking, you know, put a button on your chin, whatever. He might be stone cold sober and just be like, you know what? I'm just going to choke this fucking retard out. He likes to do a few things. I'm sure he still likes to do things like that, to be mm. fair. Um, and it was an homage to my buddy who... Circus Bear, obviously that was his call sign. So I was like, well, this will be fun. Let's make like a thousand bags of this and we'll release it. And it's literally a Circus Bear riding a unicycle, juggling a chainsaw with an SBR and then a helmet and some knots. <clears throat> Hence, Jade, well, almost said his name. You almost said that loud. Almost said his name. Almost. Oops. Compromise. Beep, beep. He's still on the job? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, he's a really good dude. Can we talk about how uncomfortably awkward this microphone setup is? Like it's, where we're all you leaning gotta raise in. your chair. You up. can see if you raise each your other's chair, souls at if this you raise distance. your chair up. But we all are like we're sharing one cubic square foot. Okay. I like of it space. It, I know it, it is not the tight, tight shot is what makes it like is, it's like it's not here. It's the magic's there. Do you get there's sexual tension at this table? <laughs> there <Yeah>. is. We, <laughs> are, we can hold each other's hands at this yeah. distance. It's hard to not play footsie with you fuckers under this. I know. It's so oh, nice. Ooh, that's, that's even down. better. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the tallest guy here looks the, the shortest. What'd you say? What was the thing? You said something. 
Circus bear. Uh, it oh, so it's a single. To... So it's a single origin. Typically, it's a micro. So it's, it's a small lot of coffee. It's from one country. And it's a very specific farm. What country? That, what farm? Uh, it depends on on what year when we're when we're doing Got what, um, and then we might do. It's called naturally processed. Or there's there's a few different ways that we can process coffee, or the the way the farms process coffee. Uh, we can do a fermented process, which is. Uh, when you leave the, the cherry on for an extended period of time and then it essentially takes some of that sugar and the taste from the cherry and it absorbs into the coffee before you actually take the the the, the cherry off. By the way, most everybody's going to like, their, their eyes are going to glaze over and it's going to be like teaching a comms class when I go into coffee. So I'm typically used to this. But the things that people need to remember is why does it taste better you know, why is it important to understand these things? It's like it comes from one farm. Typically that farm is highly specific in the way that they 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 farm the actual coffee. It's gonna be an Arabica. It, Robusta's there's there's two main genetic lines of coffee. One's uh Robusta and one's Arabica. Um and Arabica will typically mean that you have less caffeine per weight, but you can get a more uh, diverse flavor uh, out of the coffee itself. So I'm trying to like distill it down so people don't fall asleep. But is there an origin <clears throat> similar to wine where oh, the I forget the exact um, it's Venice something or other, but all of the yeah. grape vintages come they splinter off of that. Mm -hmm. Can it be drawn all the way back to a single place? Yeah, Ethiopia. Okay. Yeah. So Ethiopia is the the. Um, it is the the mother of all coffees, or however you want to look at it, and so how the origin long? story. Like huh? The actual the actual atmosphere, like I assume di the uh, temperature, the mm -hmm. humidity, yeah, all sure. the things are perfect in that. Mm -hmm. in that right? Yeah, because you've you've got enough elevation and rain with um, the because because it, it does require a, a certain amount of this is elevation. You fucking disgust me. And I know it's paper. When yeah. you look at like um, like the, the the origin story of coffee, just in general, is this goat herder, Kaladi. Uh, was out in the mountains and his goats were eating these cherries off these bushes. And then he noticed these goats were like frolicking and dancing. So you'll 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 see a lot of coffee shops called like Dancing Goat or Kaladi Coffee. Hmm. Uh, which Didn't is, your family used to own a coffee shop? No. Was that or your wife used to run? My wife, yeah, in, in yeah. Denver. Yeah, yeah. Stella is out in uh, Denver, and I thought it was called Goat something for some reason. No, well, there's a there's a coffee shop in Denver called Kaladi's, mm -hmm. which that guy uses a very specific roaster. Um, there was a uh, a guy that invented a roasting technique in like the 1970s. He also wrote a book called Coffee Technology, um, and there's a couple different volumes just that goes into the roasting process. And he was a, he was a scientist that, I, mean, I don't know if he was actually a scientist or he was just a hardcore coffee guy. He worked for like Maxwell House and Folgers and some of the bigger roasting companies. And uh, the Zevitz, was a, which is a very, um, hardcore coffee people will know what it is. Like I bought one five and a half, six years ago, which it's a, it's, it's basically a giant popcorn popper. So it roasts the entire, coffee in air, which is, hmm. it's a fluid bed process is what that's called versus a drum. So a drum works like a dryer and it's- Tumbles it. Tumbles it. Uh, and then there's multiple different things that you can plug into the roasting process in order to yield the correct result. You could say in general terms, uh, coffees just in general, they'll take roughly- eight to 10 minutes to roast. You'll heat the drum up to just above 400 pounds or 400 degrees. You'll charge the drum. The drum will drop below 200. And then your rate of rise, which will be the way that you apply heat to it in set amount of time and how much agitation and airflow, all the other kind of things that you have to plug into a roasting process will change the profile of the coffee. So it'll be darker or lighter. And then the lighter the coffee, the more you can get more of a fruit forward or some of the other, like what I would say is uh, different notes versus just burnt. If you go dark and you're turning it into carbon, you're essentially just, you're, you're turning something into, you know, ash. That's why 
I like lighter roasted coffees, which is you around- more caffeine them, right? Like medium roast no, has more yeah, caffeine? Yeah, yeah. All that is, is just, you have more, I mean, it, it's just like anything. If you're burning something, it's less intact. And so as you're applying heat to something, it, it degradates. I think that's a word, right? It degrades the actual coffee bean. And so when you're, a, a coffee bean will go, so it's endothermic, so it's pulling in heat, and then it goes exothermic, and then it's pops pushing like out yeah. heat. And as it's doing that, it's also, take you're taking away the moisture, you're pushing a lot of the, the, the components of the coffee bean itself out of the bean. And the, the more moisture you're taking out of the bean, the more closely you're aligning essentially with ash, and then you're just taking the, the, the components away from it versus a lighter bean is going to be heavier and it's going to have more water. So if you just look at it per volume, you're going to say, yes, there's more caffeine, but it's, it's minimal to the point with, to the point of which it's not even necessarily worth the debate. Just add an extra, you know, three fluid ounces to your coffee. What's your, you're what's your it. most popular coffee at BRCC Kalispell? Is it, is the, and then is that latte? Is that, what is it? It's a latte every day. Really? What do you drink? What's your thing? Pour over. Yeah. Dude. I think my best cup of coffee I've had in a long time is the Wake in the Neighbors. Yeah, that's good. Dude, my favorite coffee at Annie's place is the uh, the Nitro. Nitro Cold Brew. Yeah. Dude, that Nitro Cold Brew is like a, a Guinness, an alcohol-free Guinness. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. And it's, dude, you want to get spun up for the mm -hmm. day? You like just drink a 12, 16-ounce version of that, and you're like, whoa. It's, it's awesome. That's my favorite. What is that? Is that... Is that cold brew just pushed through nitro? That's all it is. It's all made in the same oh, cold brew vat, and one of the underneath one of the kegs goes through nitro, and the other one does not. Dude, it's so it good. Is. It's like a milkshake. Oh. Yeah. So the the reason it tastes a lot different is that when you're cold brewing something, let's say 24 or 36 hours, depending on what you know you guys are doing, 24, 24. up there. Yeah. So I. Uh, you're going to have roughly 60 to 70% less acidity in a coffee once you cold brew it uh, versus uh, hot brew. So yeah. hot brew at temperature. There's no bitter taste. There's no, no bitterness. That's there. why there's so much. It depends on the bean. There's a smooth yeah. taste, much smoother than a hot cup of coffee. So you take the same bean, for instance. Let's just take this, which I'm assuming this is beyond black. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you have absolutely no idea what no kind of idea. coffee that is. It's, it's beyond black. I'll bet you $1,000 right now it's not. I'll bet you it is. What do you think it is? Not beyond black. It's AK. Is it? Yeah. Oh. thousand dollars. Why that, did you just say it's beyond black? If it's AK. It's either beyond black or AK. Is that's that not what you said. I think it's beyond black. No. I can't tell the difference. Anyway. I know you can't. You don't know a I fucking like thing attitude. about coffee. I don't like your attitude. He's sitting here asking. He's just like, so Evan, We're canceling the coffee. next one. The beer. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do that. If you brew this like a hot brew or you brew it cold brew, you're going to have 70% acidity reduction based on the brewing method if you're doing it cold. And then if you apply nitro, which ultimately smooths out the flavor even more, so now you have less acidity and then you're applying a nitro to it, it's going to be really fucking smooth. It's yeah. going to be almost a sweet flavor. You right? don't go, mm. and it it's cascades. Amazing. It's cool. It's really good. We've played with uh, the silencer smooth in our cold mm -hmm. brew. Talk about even more bitterness removed. Holy shit, it's good. It's like zero bitterness. Yeah. What's you guys' favorite coffee because you're a connoisseur he's a connoisseur you're a connoisseur like you 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 like coffee like you like guns multiple variations multiple calibers just different kinds yeah so what's your favorite coffee outside of your your own coffee is there uh, like a go-to for you outside of mine yeah i mean the, the, my favorite coffee we've we ever roasted consistently is the secret water society it's like by far. Is that a limited? It's ECS. Yeah, it's an ECS. So, I, I mean, the exclusive coffee club is really should just be called Evan's Coffee Subscription. Like, you frame that, right? I actually think that's what I sell, tell people yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's just, like, what I want. Like, it, and it's, like, me and Ed, It's you. And you have a super heavy hand in it, so you might as well call and it. And it's very it limited, though. Yeah, there's, like, we capped a number on it, so it sells out typically within a day of when it goes live. Uh, I, I only... It is, these are the coffees that I want to drink, period. Like these are the coffees I want to drink. Mm. So every coffee is a single origin, typically a micro lot. It's going to be processed differently. I, I really like a wide variety of, of coffees. And I, I only drink coffee in the morning through a pour over. So I used to have these like 
really cool, fancy Ferrari espresso machines in my house. I just realized that one, I wasn't drinking any espresso. I only drank pour over, which is semi, uh, it's the lowest form of technology required in order to drink, but it's consistent. So everywhere I go, I can have the same cup of coffee. So Mm. if I'm drinking coffee in Northern Idaho on the river, I can drink it via Hario V60 or a Chemex. I typically don't travel with a Chemex because I've, bro- I've broken just too many of them. I could yeah. probably have supplied a, you know, the an entire village in Guatemala with books on the amount of Chemexes I've I've broken. They don't travel well. They don't. Yeah, they don't travel well. <laughs> yeah. So I, I use a black. Uh, it, it's almost like a Cerakoted Hario V60, mm-hmm. and I have a travel mug. I don't drink coffee out of uh, stainless steel. So the I, I have that thermos because I'm traveling with it, but I only drink coffee typically out of ceramic because it doesn't translate taste. Uh, I, I don't think people quite understand the levels in which I move in in the context of, of coffee. Like it's, I, I'm a fucking psychopath when it yeah. comes to it. Like you used I've, to do it all in, in the agency. I saw you like, you do all the grinding. Oh yeah. You literally grind it manually and everybody's like, what the hell is that dude doing? Like, yeah. Grinding beans. Grinding beans. So I travel with like a ceramic coffee mug. I called it the perfect coffee mug, which it, it, it's, I drink 30 grams of coffee. It yields 480 grams yielded weight. It, 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 it fills up a cup perfectly up to roughly a half inch to the top. It has a button on the top. I can put all three or four fingers within the handle. It's a light it's a light coffee mug, so you can look through the top. That's the other thing with black coffee mugs. Black coffee mug doesn't allow you to look to see how dark the coffee is. So in a light white coffee mug, I can see that's a fairly dark cup of coffee. So I can also say you've either, you're, if you've taken a light cup of coffee and brewed it incorrectly, it's going to be your ratios are off, which your brewing ratios are a whole other Uh, a whole other thing. I brew everything at a one to 16 ratio at 197 degrees. And whether I'm drinking it through a Chemex or a Hario V60 through a pour over every morning, it's somewhat irrelevant. Um, And then I have to have it typically in a ceramic mug and it's the same amount of coffee. It's the same amount of coffee. It's the same amount of caffeine every morning. That's all ECS driven. So it's all Evans coffee subscription, which I actually like that better than consistency exclusive. is the key. <clears throat> it's just like reloading or anything else, right? It's like if you have the, the entire thing around like fucking weirdos like me, it's like everything has to be the same in the context of if I'm brewing an espresso shot with, you know, the right the 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 granularity of the coffee has to be the same the amount of coffee within the porta filter has to be the same the brewing temperature and pressure has to be the same and then i have to be able to measure that against performance indicators to make sure that i can replicate that at scale it's the same thing as reloading bullets it's the same thing as like drilling drilling it's yeah. the same thing if you have a great cup of coffee and you don't know how you did it you'll never be able to replicate that again and it's gone. It's gone forever. And then you'll you'll be. It's a white whale scenario, right? You'll be like Ahab, like fucking cruising around trying to search for that thing. Interesting. Yeah. Did, did I tell you about this book that I wrote called Prepare? Oh. Can you find it on Amazon right now? You can find it on Amazon right now. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, this is a book that I wrote on preparedness. But you guys can find it. This. Where, the links are down below. Oh, good. I. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. The thing that I don't like about this is the way that picture looks. I'll tell you, I like everything about this, but there is no pictures. And the only picture that I have is what looks to be somebody that might be showing up at my house to shoot me in the face. That's the last picture. I don't understand why there's no pictures. There's pictures. There's two of them. They're graphics. That's not a picture. I know. I wanted like a picture. There's no imagery. The next book will do for you an imagery book. Yeah, yeah. A picture book? Or maybe something (laughs) that I could take. And fill in some color in, you know? Yeah. Like, a, like what do they call those? A coloring book. Why did you approve that picture on the back? I did. Inside cover. They just did it, and it just made me mad. I apologize. You had, had no control over the picture they used of you in the book? They chose it. They printed it, and I said, I didn't want that, and they said it's too late. We so you were really hands-on in this process. I'm completely so hands-on. <laughs> I mean, my name's on the side, but I didn't write anything in this book. You didn't? No. No. I mean... 
<sighs> I don't know. Maybe you should have got jo- you should have got Jocko to do it for you. He, he, he could have. He could have like, done a better job at that book. That book's a national bestseller because of. It's a My weird friends. flex. Is it selling well? It is super weird flex. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys wanted to make it a better bestseller, you can find it in the link below. Yeah. 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 I like that. Mike, Thanks by my shit lover. <laughs> Thanks for the support. <laughs> Thanks for the support. Yeah. Um, so the Maui thing. Let's talk about that. So it, obviously it's in preparedness. And I don't know. Do you guys know anybody who's actually affected by that? So Denver spent years in Maui. Wow. And uh, actually myself, Denver... His partner at the time, my son, and two good friends of ours from Chicago went to Lahaina in November of last year, and they got scuba diving uh, certified. The house we stayed at burned to the ground. Seriously? Yeah. So uh, he knows of quite a few people who lost everything. Yeah. So how did that? How did the fire start? It's speculative. It's speculative now. Really? Speculative but, how it how it grew to the velocity it did was like eighty mile an hour winds though. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, so it was wind. Yeah. And there's a class action lawsuit that was filed today because the power company never shut down the power grid. Which apparently they do in high winds, they de energize the lines, I yes. guess, to prevent something oh, like okay, that. Okay, okay. So it could it, be it something sparked, to do with that. Yeah. So here's what uh here's what my business partner Denver has told me. They were evacuated one time previously. Uh, have you guys ever been to Lahaina? No. I've never been. No. There is a freeway that, um, God, I'm is not even north I'm, south. Right? I'm not even going to guess the geography. Yeah. There's a freeway though, and uh, as you're driving into Lahaina, on the right hand side, it goes up into the yeah. into the hills, mountains, whatever you describe it as. He said that they had a fire that reached the road <laughs> while he was living there, and they stopped it at the road. But had they not, his estimate was that it would have done the same thing because if you look at the architecture that was there, it was generally quite dated. Right. All wood. Wood. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, a yeah. temperature that is largely dry. Um, and so once it started hopping, I, my personal guess is that the death toll is going to be somewhere near about a thousand. Yeah. Seriously. Same. Yeah. There's because there was Same. also down in that area. So we and what was crazy is we walked down that main street and like bought board shorts. We rented diving gear to do the certification for everybody from a dive shop that burned down. We went and trained jujitsu at a gym wow. that fucking burned to the ground. Um, and there's there was like uh, micro resorts along that main street area, and I I mean like I don't know if anybody got out of those things. Yeah, they said right now it's I mean as of this podcast it's near a hundred yeah thousand plus people missing. They said that um, the fire hydrants didn't have water pressure, so even when they hooked up lines they couldn't put out extinguish any existing fires. They have a a scientific um, research facility there that studies tsunamis, and they have a, a pretty robust tsunami system that's a sounding alarm. 80 speakers. It, yeah. Everywhere. And they didn't activate them. And so a lot of the things, in fact, a, a survivor from a documentary I saw this morning on YouTube, uh, independent media, was saying that there was a line of traffic, because there's one road in, one road mm, out, yep. as, as I'm aware. Um, and that road got blocked by tourists because the tourists are trying to leave because of, of, of the, just tourist gridlock. Sure. Then when the first power lines dropped, they shut down that road because they were trying to prevent anybody getting killed from electricity because they fell because of the winds. So when they shut down that road and it was gridlocked, all those people were stuck in traffic. And when the fire swept through, a lot of those people fled into the water, but a lot of people didn't. I mean, one gentleman said um, all his friends, which are three friends, and the two dogs that were in the car behind him, all of them died as he moved to the water. They and, died in their car? And they died in their cars. And he I said, mean, what's the call there, right? Like, you're, yeah. you're having to choose between – every option you have is shitty. Yeah. I mean, even if you make it to the water, being on the water edge with winds like that, it's not yeah. going to – you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you have to get away from the actual shore itself. Right. I, yeah. I mean, what's the, I mean, fuck, what do you do? They said hundreds Early of evacuation is, I think, your only. That's it. I mean, well, having a, an immediate plan that you immediate action, right? Right. But they said hundreds of people fled in the water. And I somebody DM'd me this morning and said, um, a lot of people survive in the water. They're, I mean, mm-hmm. there's families that survive in the water. But what they're not reporting is 
hundreds of people died in the water. They drowned in the water because yep. those winds were yeah. creating riptides and oh, a whole right. bunch of issues in the water. Yeah, yeah. And they were swept out to sea yeah. and they didn't account for those. So, so there's people who are reporting that were in the water in the right position, I think, saw a whole bunch of people drown. And uh, the bodies currently would be at the bottom of the ocean until obviously they'd decomposition. Be, yeah, they'd they would start be, they'd be rising at this point. Yeah, and we're a week into it. We're, I mean, we're only a week into this. But it's the the largest disaster in American history as a natural disaster, besides San Francisco. But a lot of the casualties in San Francisco that happened in the early 1900s happened because they had. Um, I mean, basically everybody was looting, and then they had uh, martial. Was it called? Um, was it martial? What's the martial law? Martial law where local people were enforcing their own laws and they were killing a lot of the people that were looting. Mm. So a lot of the deaths were actually attributed to gunshots and, and people getting killed, not the actual fire, which cost hundreds of lives. But What year was that? Was the looting? Because we talking about yesterday or? No, this is like 19, early 1900s. So this is yeah, like- the fire? Think, yeah, the fire. Hard to say because I just watched a news story about like $300,000 loss that? for a store in San Francisco. Yeah. Smash them. I mean, people just run in with hoodies yeah, and just grab shit. Now. Yeah. It's insane. I, I, you know, I, I had talked to you, uh, you about it, Evan, I think last night or this morning, I can't remember, but the hard thing is how do you support something like this? Like, how do you, yeah. because, um, one thing that is obviously the case in this situation is there's no immediate response. Right. That by this time, I mean, I, I saw it this morning, we're six days into it. I saw this morning. At this point today, Tulsi Gabbard came out on Fox News and said there's zero federal support here. There's National Guardsmen walking around. They're deploying a couple handful of dogs. The The sheriff just reported, the Maui sheriff just reported today, or the Lahana uh, sheriff just reported today, 3% of the total area has been covered by cadaver dogs. They 3%. Three. That's it. And, and the 90 plus bodies that have been identified, only a couple of them were actually discovered. The rest were ashed remains that were mm -hmm. identified likely by the cadaver dogs. So you're talking about 3%, wow. 100 people. Yeah, that, that math does not work in, our, yeah, in yeah. favors for survival. And 100 miles away is one of the largest bases in the country for yeah. our nation. And why would you not deploy every asset? Like even if you're, you're, you're going to be political about it. Can they though? I, I think they could. I mean, they, we've done it before. We, Where? The National Guard has. Because Leah was asking me about this. She said, well, because I was making the same yeah. point. Like, first thought, I was like, well, get the Chinooks and Blackhawks up and go pluck people out of the water. I'm like, 80-mile-an-hour uh, winds? Yeah. That's, that shit ain't going to work. No. No, so it'd have to calm yeah. down. But then she asked. She was like, well, can they? And I actually didn't know the answer to that because the U.S. military does not have a domestic charter. The National Guard does. Yeah, that's true. The, so the active military has been deployed. I know they're shuttling in like Globemasters. Yeah. They're shuttling over uh, fire equipment and stuff from yeah. other islands. But I don't, can the U.S. military We did do it in Puerto Rico, um, but yeah. it was really late to By the By order of the president. I mean, essentially, yeah. you have an executive We order. did it actually in, um, I mean, not yeah. Katrina. What was the bad one in New Orleans? Was it yeah. Katrina? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the 82nd Airborne Division was deployed there. Mm -hmm. Made more for security, but they were doing humanitarian stuff. But you think like- that would be the time to be at ground zero as a president or as a leader to say, hey, we're going to give us give the full support and do everything we can. As, the, as he did that, um, or as he didn't do that, the day that the fire started, they proposed $24 billion additional funding for Ukraine for this year, this fiscal year. I assume that's October to October for the government. But they just proposed that in a bill – that had 12 billion set aside for natural disaster response for Americans, but tied to a bill that had additional 24 billion for Ukraine support. Mm. I think it was a 12 billion for armament and an additional eight plus whatever billion for humanitarian aid for Ukraine. And it's like, what are our priorities in this? It just doesn't make sense to me. I think the timing of that is probably ironic and not intentional. Of, of course. Yeah, that yeah, bill I'm sure was drafted months ago, if not years ago. I just ago. feel like there's more, and, and that's a- What would you do yeah. though? So, I, you know, that's the question, right? Like, like even in, from my perspective, I told my team yesterday, I'm like, we are a preparedness company. 
if we can't deploy, activate, tell the story on the ground, and do good by these people, then what the fuck is the point of this? Like, right. why are we why are we talking about preparedness and all this stuff if we're just on the sidelines like everybody else, virtue signaling about something to do? We should be on the front lines of it, doing our best. I texted Tulsi, I asked a whole bunch of people, and the input and the feedback that I got was there are already organizations on the ground doing the work. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a air, I think it's called aerial. I apologize. I don't know what it is. I'll, I'll figure it out later. I'll look it up when yeah. you guys are talking. But there's a veteran response force of military veterans that are already there. They flew there in aircraft. They usually do first aid kind of stuff. They're on the ground helping. Uh, the guy who runs it is a, for, is a former military guy, but a physician. And they it's like doctors without borders type deal. Mm-hmm. But they're actually making effective change. I think it's supporting those entities that are action arms and not being on the ground like, we're doing something here, handing out bottles. It's like that's yeah. that's not going to that's I, not going to help. I mean, I think I think that's the biggest one, which is early on in any in any situation I've been involved in, in any of these, we'll call them uh, crisis response. In the context of this is a natural disaster, it's affecting people. Obviously, like it, 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 it's a it's a national and international impact. The problem is you have a bunch of parasitical organizations that attach so themselves to things man. like this, yeah. and then they're exploitive. So one of the things that we try to do is take a little bit more time, figure out exactly who is doing what, so then we can apply those dollars to the organizations that are going to have the most impact. Uh, we we saw a lot of this. like we There was a ton of this happening during the, uh, uh, the, the Taliban uh, – you know, it surged through Afghanistan. You had a bunch of exploitist, they weren't veteran run organizations. You had a bunch of people out of like Russia and in all of these other tertiary countries looking at saying, well, we, if you give us, you know, a half a million or quarter million or whatever dollars, we'll get these people out of like, like Mazar or some of these, some of these other uh, places will fly them into Pakistan. Well, the other issue is, is like, well, you get them out of the country. Where are you taking them? And then what's going to happen once they're out of country? So are they going to be yeah. homeless and in, in you know Peshawar? Where what, what what happens? So are we taking them out of country into a circumstance in which now they're going to be indentured servants in Saudi Arabia? Like what are we doing here? So yeah. you have to ask all the second and third order effect questions as to who is the organization, how long have they been around, what is the actual impact of your dollar, uh, and and to be fair, I've just been waiting for. Uh, I, I think we'll, we'll say the top three type of organizations that we can support, plug in and help out. Uh, obviously, Tulsi would be a great resource. Yeah. She would know. Uh, Mark Healy, he's out there, obviously. Yeah, he texted me this morning. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we'll put some links in, in the podcast here so people can go to the links, uh, check out some organizations, and obviously – We'll do a fundraiser too. So Mike and I have talked about it, whether or not we're going to donate your Land Cruiser. Is it Land, or Land Cruiser? Yeah. yeah. Right-hand Land Cruiser. Yeah, right-hand Land Cruiser. I think we'll do like a full couple days of like all the proceeds from Black Rifle Coffee's direct-to-consumer will go back to that organization to, to help out the families that have been out there. But first, let's figure out where are we sending the money before yeah. we start? Because... Like the the exploitive sociopathic issues of this like country and social media that it promotes is like you got a bunch of virtue signaling fucking retards, yeah, and they like to like post and tell people all the great things they're doing, and ultimately they could just be lining somebody else's pockets, uh, like, and we've seen that happen multiple times yeah. over the last ten years of this business, you know, whether it's, um you know, go donate to this organization. And then you find out two or three weeks later that the organization was essentially just a shell for a bunch of shit bags that were, were taking a bunch of money and putting it in their pockets. Then they're filing bankruptcy and then going moving to like Puerto Rico or something. Right. So yeah. let's make sure that we're doing the right thing first. Uh, aerial recovery group is mm. the, the guys. And that's a whole bunch of people hit me up about them because they're on the actual ground and Aerial they, recovery. They're veteran-led humanitarian special operators on a mission to save wow. lives, stop stop evil, and they're on the ground, actually, you know, getting it done right there. Wow! And they had an interview on the news. The, the, the right. head guy, who's a physician, was on the news doing it. But I, I texted Tulsi about that very thing because that's what sucks is like these kind of things. People they'll set up a GoFundMe. It's like here's the link. Go send money here. It's like that person is in the and it's in America on, on the on the forty eight lower forty eight and they're getting all the money in their account. Yeah. And one of the guys from Maui was like, 
that's very good that a lot of people are raising money, but how the hell are we going to get the money? Yeah. We don't have electricity. We don't have access to banks. We right. have no money. Yeah, yeah. And, and these people that were displaced, they don't have anything. I mean, there's people that were displaced they did interviews with. There's children in these shelters that have no family right. because their entire family was killed. Wow. They were just lucky to get away. There's a, there's a kid who fled on a surfboard, and he thinks his entire family was uh, killed, and he was floating on a surfboard for six hours. And it's like, hold, that's the circumstance of likely thousands of Americans where they're potentially, like Annie said, there's thousands of casualties of lost lives. And this is our country. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think you're spot on, because we, we talked about it with Ukraine, we talked about it with the Afghan uh, evacuation. A lot of people try to exploit this, and it's like, dude, like, let's slow down, take a, take a deep breath. You know, we, we'll do that deliberate raffle. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll promote it, raise all the money, take all the money and put it into the right organizations that are going to help and impact it. Cause I, I told my guys, I'm like, so what are we going to do? We're going to go over there and help. I'm like, are, we are likely getting in the way. If we're there, yeah, yeah. we're likely getting in the way in some form. I do not want to distract, but like Tulsi said on Fox news this morning, nobody's not, nobody's telling the actual story on the ground. Right. National media isn't reporting the real issues that these people are dealing with on the ground. And that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to educate people and go, here's what happened, exactly what happened. Here's what we can learn from it. And here's how to never make that mistake again. Because like, like uh, you said, Denver, I think that fire was 10 years ago. Uh, somebody told me about it mm -hmm. and they said it almost evaporated the entire island. It, it was this close. If, this it, close. if it had jumped the freeway, he thinks it would have happened yeah. again. Apparently yeah. the fire risk there. And again, this is anecdotal of me talking with my business partner and I don't know who he necessarily talked to, but the risk from fire was not unknown. Right. So it was one of those things that was kind of top of mind, maybe a priority for the community that they really didn't. At times. Got it. You at know, times. At, yeah. When it was the dry season or the windy mm -hmm. season. I don't, I don't know necessarily the, the way the humidity rolls through there. But you have like, there's no rush in doing what you're talking about. Yeah, like no the, the lessons learned and what to do moving forward. It's going to, because I guess the question is, what are they, I mean, to rebuild first, they have to finish the recovery effort. Yeah. God knows how long that's going to take. Months. Then they'd, well, then they'd have to clean, yeah. which on an Island, I mean, what are you going to do with all that stuff? Then start the rebuilding process, which is going to be a, probably a massive drain on the infrastructure just to rebuild. I mean, you're talking a matter of years. Yeah. You have, there's time yeah, to do yeah. it appropriately. We'll do it right. Yeah. Well, and I think you should take the money you raise and send somebody from your organization over there to hand deliver it. One yeah, of the first will. things, we first things I saw was like countless GoFundMe's for pictures of families. And it's right, like, how right. do you know? I mean, how do you know? How do you know that your money is going to go to anything? I think you guys are correct, and everybody. It's. I think it's awesome that people are like, hey, I'll like, where can I send help? But I think sending it to a large organizations that actually have some oversight and accountability is the way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, you're, you're kind of playing a little bit of Russian roulette. Well, I mean, you know, Americans are just, they're the most philanthropic nation in the, in the world. And they love to support these types of things in the context of like, they want to support, they want to lean in, they want to donate money. And what happens is they donate money to a, some shady characters. And then yeah. ultimately... <laughs> Not only are they, is their heart in the right place, they're trying to do good, but then they, they, they accelerate bad versus doing a little bit of research, making sure that your dollars are going to go into the right spot. So that, that's, I think that's the, the, the mentality where we're at right now, you know, because I would love to do like a coffee specific product, right? Where, you know, importing coffee from, you know, like a Kona or something like that. Yeah. Kona's are already super expensive. It's like $50 a pound. But the bean from Kona yeah, from the island. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Uh, so I, I think that's probably obviously being a coffee company, that's the easiest thing that I can do because then you're just selling a coffee and then you're turning around and donating all the proceeds back uh, directly to, you know, somebody that we trust that has, you know, a substantial history. We can develop a story around too, which is also part of this. It's like, who is it? Where where you know where are your dollars going and showing you know, it yeah yeah and showing, showing it yeah. yeah I mean it'll be years you yeah, guys will have years. plenty of time to Dude, get behind it's, projects it's insane how that that rebuilding effort man when you or see do you pictures. rebuild I mean that's another question yeah. too yeah, I mean how like the the from my understanding and again from memory being there about a year ago 
it was it's grass. There's a lot of grass leading up to that freeway. You know, the, it gets the yeah. the vegetation changes as you go up. But like, I mean, fuck that shit burns. Yeah, you know, Tulsi. I think Tulsi said the fear for most native Hawaiians on uh, in that neighborhood specifically. That whole place has been there for I think she said twelve generations, and wow. you know it, it was the original capital yeah. of Hawaii, and so it's got a lot of history, and like that's part of the problem because it's historical buildings wow. made of wood. It it's, was Lahaina was the yeah. last seat of the last Hawaiian king. Yeah, really? mm -hmm. yeah, and then and then their fear is in the rebuilding effort. <clears throat> well, the government could step in and say we're not going to rebuild, and then they basically uh, use it as an opportunity to land grab. And they mm -hmm. potentially land grab versus rebuilding it, mm. maybe the modern way, right? But and making it more fireproof. Right. I mean, th the problem with that whole infrastructure is everything went up. The guy, I mean, the governor of Hawaii said that um, there was tw twisted metal and molten metal everywhere because the heat was so yeah. intense, mm -hmm. um, and it was oh, brutal, man. So devastating. I think I think it, the the wind ran perpendicular to the road, so it was a kind of. Yeah. And I'm speaking out of lane here, but basically it was like. It would be like a north-south running road, yeah. and it's an east-to-west running wind. So you had no place to go. Right. I mean, the guys that escaped this documentary this morning, the guy ran five miles down a highway road and didn't run into one first responder and because they had shut down the portion yeah, of yeah. it, but he didn't even know where they were going because there's like nowhere to go. And when they were running down the road, they thought they were going to run into help, couldn't get help, and then realized... They're just going to die if they keep running down the road because the wind's coming across the yeah, highway. Yeah. So they just hit the water and they they literally stood in water for six seven hours and just kept their mouth above the water when it was getting intense and then survived that way, which is wow. a lot of survival stories. That's crazy. There's not a lot of those. I mean, there's a lot of people that died. Obviously, it's crazy, man. Yeah, that's crazy. That's that that's intense. Yeah, I wanted from a kind of crisis action plan perspective. Mm -hmm. I want to do an investigation and ask as many questions as possible for people uh, who experienced it and then come up with like, hey man, this is the this is technically what happened. Here's the breakdown, t timing of events, and then talk about, hey, what can we do to repair this in the future? Right. Like what is the immediate action plan that is going to statistically increase survival on the island? And it, you have to have an infrastructure and a robust plan and a recommendation we don't tend to do that in disasters. We just write no. it off and go, all right, let's just get back to it. Same thing happened in Paradise. I mean, Paradise, 85 people perished. Some statistics say 89, but 85 is like um, Paradise. what most people agree on. It, it was the Camp Fire fire that happened in a town called Paradise, California. California Northern oh, okay. California. Arson. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the top five fires in history, um, four of them are in California. Four, oh, yeah. 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 And so... Um, paradise ripped through and they had a matter of minutes to escape, but they were surrounded by a tree line and it ripped through same kind of case. But, um, I don't yeah. think you can have an infrastructure in place for some settings like that. I think your only hope is early identification and making a decision. Right. Yeah. I, well, I think at the, in the rebuilding phase, like obviously there's structural material uh, th that you could use to kind of minimize fire pushing mm -hmm. and and if you look at there's actually some buildings that survived and there were com commercial buildings mm -hmm. and they were made of concrete i mean yeah, yeah. it's obvious like if it's a concrete building fires not going to penetrate the walls might burn the roof off whatever but if you have those as a as a as a uh, fire stop like you would have as a fire break mm -hmm. that would act as a fire break you know it's right. like a tank trail at fort bragg yeah, yeah. that's wide enough would potentially stop the fire. In this particular case, based on all the buildings being what they're made of, it wouldn't have mattered. Right. Because that wind, the embers that flew, I mean, there was people in the water hiding and their heads were, all their hair were, were, was getting set on fire from the embers going into the ocean. There's a video where all the boats that were docked, because people are like, why don't yeah, they get yeah. in a boat? Yeah. All of them are on fire. And it's like, well, how did that get on fire? Well, because the, the wind was activating the embers and pushing yeah. it into the water. It's like, oh, you can't even fathom that type no. of uh, I don't even think you can fight fire in 80 mile an hour wind. You can, or 80 know, knot wind, which no. would be what, 88 miles an hour? It's like yeah. impossible. Jesus. Well, I mean, it, it, and you think about it, it's like there's nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Like there's nowhere to go. There's there's not a good choice. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, I guess there's a choice. None of them are good. Yeah. Some are better than others. Yeah. But 
even your decision making at that point, whether to go, you know, one direction or the other, based on the wind, based on the way that the, the fire is behaving. None of us are fire experts. We don't fucking know how fire is behaving. Like, like yeah. so, you know, we we don't even know if like going to the ocean is the right the right call. Yeah. Like I wouldn't know. Not like, for I'd, army guys. Yeah. No, absolutely no, not. I like, would be and I would go in. You have hydrophobia. You wouldn't want to go in there. This is fucking crazy. <laughs> I probably would animals? just run into the fire, given the choice. I'm like, if I have to get wet, I'm just going to yeah, sprint into the fire. <laughs> sprint fire. I, uh, some guys got on boats and hauled ass. And so if you were oh, near yeah. a boat that was, and you, I mean, the difficult thing was obviously the winds were kicking up yeah. the surf. But if you could get in a boat and move offshore as quickly as possible. Yeah. In fact, most of the first responders that pulled people out of the water their first response for themselves as an immediate action was, holy shit, the fire station just went down. The freaking, my house just got burned to the ground, get in the boat. Yeah. And they were actually off the shore yeah. picking up people. And you know, kudos to them. And they were just oh, in the right man. place at the right time. Well, but even then, you know, when you think about asphyxiation with the smoke yeah. and then being in water. A lot of people, like, yeah. Obviously, like, you know, as you're going under, you know, escaping the smoke and the embers and all those other things, you're going in and out trying to figure out like how to manage your oxygen intake with the smoke and the embers and then the water itself. Like that's a super complex survival scenario. Super complex. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's scary. It, that, I mean, like that's that would be horrifying to go through with your yeah. family. Like yeah. like with your kids and your family. I'd be fucking horrified. Looking for Tulsi. No, nothing yet. Yeah. I have a survivor. Her and her kids survived. The husband pushed them to Utah, so they're actually here right now. Mm -hmm. And then he flew back to help and volunteer with to help families. But she's here in town, I think, this week on Prep Life. I'm going to interview her for the show and just talk to her about her situation and how she survived. Um, I think most every survivor – that I've seen survive because they were in the water. Uh, there's yeah. no survivors that or stayed early made. evacuation. Yeah, or early evacuation. They got out in yeah. you know in time. And there's there's Wait, two fires still burning. I, on the I, I think that's a pretty interesting common thread in survival, though. It's making good decisions early. Yeah. It it just from a survival perspective, it's make a decision, make it early, and like move. Like that's yeah. the other thing. It's like people when they when they stay because of their property, like a lot of these people that end up dying because of their their yeah. their property because they don't want to lose their property or they wait too long and they 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 essentially, you know, indecision and then the decision to stay with you know their their material possessions because they have something that's material, it it costs them their life. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I, I think making good decisions around these are material things that ultimately insurance or fucking who cares insurance doesn't replace. Yeah. They're not going to replace you or your family. So making a good decision early. Yeah. I, I, I just think that that's a fairly common thread. I mean, yeah. when I've, when I've heard about, it, especially with like California fires and wildfires and things like that, it's like making a decision because what people have done, and I've seen this a lot is they'll identify there's an issue. And you'll see it even with violent situations where they see things like unfolding, like people get caught in in riots or they get caught in you know scenarios where they've identified something could go the wrong way, but they're just not acting fast enough or their indecision will yeah. end up costing them, you know, either life limb or eyesight, right? Like they're gonna get beat up or fucked up or robbed or something like that. Yeah, just, they, yeah. Yeah. Because you know why? Because they're, 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 they're in a, they're, they're in a, uh, and this isn't talking about Hawaii. I'm just like most people, like they're in such a place of safety all the time. They don't understand that the world can turn on them in a split second. And then they're going to become part of the environment at any point in time. You can become part of the environment. Like they just don't understand it. I yeah. think, like, like, like when, when, uh, I used to explain this to people, like the speed of violence, right? The speed of, con the speed of, of combat, it's so fucking accelerated. And that's the one thing that people don't, and going into combat, they never really could, took into consideration how fast it happens. You go from like fucking nothing to like, this is happening so fast. I don't quite comprehend 
the way that, that the world is interacting with me anymore because everything's snapping at the speed of fucking, you know, above the speed of sound. So you go from like sitting on your fucking thumbs and 60 miles an hour or whatever it is to now things are moving at such a faster pace. You can't comprehend it unless you've been in it multiple times. Yeah. And, and then it goes back to sitting on your thumbs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'm just going to take a quick nooner, <laughs> take a quick snooze over here, get recharged <laughs> for the fucking afternoon push. <laughs> so true. But is it, they, we, we had a fire that was within a mile and a half of the house. You guys have both stayed at, yeah. at the lake last year and they were doing evacuations. And it, it was that same, you would see people metaphorically, not actually physically yeah. watching them do it, but stay or go, stay or go, stay or go. I literally took my truck out there, grabbed some documents that I, couldn't replace and got the fuck out of there. It's like, that's why you have fire insurance, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 It's it, uh, in survival psychology. There's a psychologist named John Leach who studied this. It has to do with denial. That's the is initial, that what it is? That's initial responses. But he studies like brackets of demographics of populations that live or die in these circumstances. The bottom 90%. I mean, there's a, there's the top 10% survive because they make, rapid decisions mm, under stress. Interesting. And and that is a um, a common theme across the board. 80% of that population, half of them make the right decision or the wrong decision on the bottom end of it, yeah. but at least they're making decisions. And that, that weighs who's going to survive or die. It's like the guy on the second floor story runs to the third, third floor and jumps off and forgets right. he's on the third floor, yeah. lands on his head. It's the guy who gives everybody a life preserver, jumps in with his family, and then realizes he doesn't have one, and then he drowns because he can't swim. Mm. They're moving, but they're not making the right always decisions. And at the bottom 10% is typically the bottom of the barrel, but also children because they don't have- oh, they don't have the reps. Prefrontal yeah. cortexes, so yeah. they don't have experience, the reps. And that's what's scary about people who don't understand this concept with families you have many liabilities with you. Yeah. And when when that when something like that happens, you're in a car and there's a fire sweeping across the highway and you have to make a decision right now. What I always tell people is like all you have to do is factor in and weigh what would I do right now? And and that's QA, right? Mm -hmm. You could go through the hypotheticals, build the model, adapt the scripts, and just think about it. You know, if you're a patrol officer sitting in your patrol car, you got plenty of time to think about it. And that will help kind of build the reps in your head, but you have to be prepared to act. I had a survivor who told me a lot of people he saw die pulled out their cell phones. They were they were like on the phone walking. They're like, dude, this is going to be on the gram. You know, it's like this is crazy. Whether it's historical or I'm going to increase my TikTok, follow, whatever that is, the psychology of picking this up versus picking up your kids and be like, we're we're getting the fuck out of here. They might have been trying to call for help. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. he, he saw people recording right? and he left and bypassed a lot of people that were recording and made up a lot of time where there was no time. I mean, can you imagine? You're already out of time, right? Well, you yeah, see it in yeah, every, yeah. you see it everywhere. You see it all, everywhere. Yeah. It, 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 the first default is it, like, mm -hmm. uh, this happened three days ago. It happened on last Friday. I was uh, headed out to the mobility course because we had a mobility experience course and I was at a gas station pumping gas and I hear, Boosh! And I was like, okay, somebody just got T-boned in the intersection. And I look across the intersection at the gas station I was at, and a woman ran. As soon as I looked up and I saw her, I looked at the light. It was red, so she ran a red light, gets T-boned, flips her car around, and it's landed in the middle of the road. Um, I put up the gas pump. I run over there and make sure everything's kind of safe for myself. And I immediately go up, and I see people driving by us. 40, 50 miles an hour with our cameras out. Not one person stopped. And whatever, I don't, I don't even care. I go up to her and I say, hey, are you okay? And she's like in shock. And she has her phone in her hand. She gets out of the car, like she just had the accident. She didn't get on the phone in her hand and call 911. She was on her phone texting. And she got out of the phone with her screen still open in shock because she was glued like this, likely because she was driving like that. Gets out of the, the car and I'm like, are you okay? And I knew exactly what happened. She goes, I think I made a mistake. I, w I think I ran that red light. I was like, you, you did run the red light. I'm going to check on the other people, but here's what I need you to do. And I told her to get on the road. She was shaking, adrenaline, all the stuff. But most people don't realize, even in car accidents, that was minor. I mean, her car was totaled. She wasn't injured. 
even in minor car accidents, if you're not prepared for that and you're not conditioned for it, like stress, you are going to have adverse reactions that are going to cause you to freeze and clam up. Mm -hmm. So she was just frozen. She was standing as she got out of the car in the middle of two lanes of traffic that were going around her. Nobody's stopping to bother um, to, to stop and see if she's okay. So I had, to, I had to physically go, I need you to walk over to the sidewalk. And she couldn't do it. She's like, huh, what? And she, she had no cognition. She's in survival mode, right, fight right. or flight. She's in a sympathetic nervous response. I physically take her by the arm and walk her to the sidewalk and tell her to sit on the ground. Because I'm like, oh, she has to be communicated this way very concisely. If not, she'll just roam around until her cognition comes back, until she comes off that, that high. She sits down. I take um, I take her car, physically get in it, and pull it off the road so nobody hits it because it's facing the opposite lane of traffic in the middle of the road, three-lane traffic. Drive it to the side. There's construction cones. I literally take the cones and put it around the car to protect that, and I tell her, don't go near your vehicle because you'll get hit again. Like, you literally will run into – somebody will hit you because they're not paying attention. And as, as I'm kind of seeing this unfold, I'm like, most people, not just children at the bottom 10%, can't handle